everyone. Welcome to The Download, where we bring you discussion and analysis from a Catholic perspective. Today's Wednesday. It is Wednesday, my dudes, June 28th. I'm Simon Rafe, here with my esteemed co-hosts, Carl Copey and Nick Wiley. Good to have you with us, guys. And joining us once again is our resident theologian, one of our many resident theologians, really, I suppose, <laughs> Dr. William Mahoney. How you doing, B? Good. How are you? Excellent. I'm well. We turn back the pages of history today to the second century to revisit the life and teachings of an inf influential and instrumental figure in the early church, St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Known as a great defender of the Christian faith during a time of significant theological challenges, his work laid the foundation for mus much of Christian and Catholic doctrine. His writings, particularly against heresies, stand as a monumental piece against Gnostic teachings, defending the unity of God and the humanity of Christ, and affirming the physical resurrection and the goodness of creation. His invaluable contribution to our understanding of apostolic succession, emphasizing the importance of the bishops as the successors of the apostles, has shaped the hierarchical structure of the church as we know it today. Moreover, his concept of recapitulation, where he highlighted Christ as the new Adam who leads humanity back to God, is central to Catholic soteriology, or the study of salvation. Today, we are discussing St. Irenaeus and the heresy of Gnosticism, which is not a problem of the past. In fact, it is unfortunately alive and well. Dr. Mahoney, let's start with you. I had a whole bunch of like $5 words in there. Please explain to us what is Gnosticism <laughs> and why did it start? Why is it a problem? Yes, so Gnosticism uh, comes from the Greek gnosis, which means knowledge, and it's basically this idea that salvation is based on you obtaining a secret knowledge. Um, it it kind of heralds, well, it does herald back to the Garden of Eden, where the devil says to them, uh, offering them knowledge of good and evil mm. and he's basically saying to them like no 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 God's jealous of you because he doesn't want you to become like him and know what he knows of course it's completely based in a lie wisdom in the book of wisdom we told that it was through envy of the devil that sin entered the world and he's trying to say no it's God who's envious of you so he's accusing God of what he's most guilty of you know the typical yeah. uh, and of course the, 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 the tree that they're not allowed to eat from is the tree of knowledge, knowledge right of exactly. good and evil. yeah so, it's, so he, yeah so he's twisting everything so the devil's twisting it I'm the good guy who's gonna free you with this secret knowledge and God doesn't want you to know because he's envious of you actually he is and and also one more thing on that what he offers them is you'll become like a God by knowing this well they're already like God they were made in the image and likeness of God so he's offering them something they already have <laughs> he's saying that God's uh, envious when actually he is and he's offering something that can only bring death but he's saying it'll bring you salvation so it's all twisted right that's the devil but from this it stems this uh, this false idea that uh, you need a kind of you need secret knowledge to be saved and this was there's like hints of it in the New Testament but it's not really pronounced like there were that there were some people who were t focusing a lot on mm. Greek philosophy and knowledge and, but it really was in the second century when Irenaeus, uh, Saint Irenaeus comes along and actually we know a lot about, about a lot of these early Gnostic heretics from him, from his, him arguing against them. And, um, one for example uh, is Valentinus and what these guys do is Valentinus comes along and he builds a very, very structured system to explain this secret knowledge. In his system, there is, there's a father, and he's a spiritual being. There's this place, the heavens, or I don't know, the spiritual realm, he calls it the Pleroma. And in the Pleroma, uh, there are emanations from the father that are, he calls aeons. And the, I know, it's very bizarre, so I'll just bear, bear with this. How much does he charge him for this? Yeah. I, like, <laughs> I don't know. That I don't know. pretty penny off this. It, it, it does, know. doesn't it? It, it does sounds like one of those that. late night TV things that they come along. For only yeah. twenty nine ninety nine, and then they'll yeah. throw in something else with it. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, we'll get you a special coin or some, you know, the, the, the special <laughs> bracelet or something. Exactly. That will channel the energy of these aeons. Or yeah, it, it gets even weirder with some of them. And okay, so there's these aeons, and one of them, Sophia, which is wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, wisdom tries to contemplate the father, but that was a, that was a mistake. But because uh, wisdom did this, another thing emanates from her. Or no, I, I don't say her because I don't think he specifies. But from this aeon, and that is uh, most people call it the demiurge. And the demiurge is now ignorant of the pleroma, the spiritual realm. So he cre or it creates a material realm, and that is the place where we are. And then humans now are 
basically we're trapped. So we're trapped here because we don't know about the pleroma. So we need this secret knowledge to be freed from matter. So it ends up being kind of dualistic. There's like matter's not good, yeah. matter's bad, spirit's good, pleroma's good. He didn't know that, so he made this world. So basically we're a mistake. And um, now we need the secret knowledge to be saved. He does, Valentinius does go into Christ and the Holy Spirit as well. Um, and he's, but the way he sees them are, they're just uh, helping us get this secret knowledge that we need. It's not the redemption's kind of out the window in this in the Christian. Because sense. redemption, of course, within, yeah. within this Gnostic structure, is is a, is a, is a knowledge based right. redemption. And of course, I think you know that, that there's probably a lot of people out there, Catholics, who are kind of thinking, well, hold up, you know, um, if I've got the knowledge. That, that Jesus died for me and I've got the knowledge that, that his death is salvific and I've got that knowledge that I need to access. Well, am I not saved through knowledge? And it, it, it's a very different thing from that. It's like once you have this knowledge, you come and you participate within the, the sacramental life of the church. You become a member of the church. You receive Christ's body. You're not saved through the fact that you know this, uh, and which of course is, is, is you know, the, the classic example that you know, even the devils uh, believe and tremble and belief in itself, some knowledge certainly is not enough uh, for any degree of salvation. But that is what kind of Gnosticism is, is saying. It's like, oh yeah, you've got this secret key to the world, which is only accessible to a few. That's but right. when do you know that you know what you need to know? I'm, I don't think you should try to make sense of it. Given yeah, the fact yeah, that this yeah, started yeah. by somebody trying to contemplate the Father, yeah. and, and then this kicked off the whole thing, I think, yeah. I think that the, the Gnostics would probably tell you you're thinking too much. All right, yeah. You're, 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 you're moving into knowledge they can't charge you for, to move back to our previous statement. Because if I get out of my body by knowledge, did he have the knowledge? Because he was still in his body trying to tell me about the knowledge that I needed to have. I, uh, I don't really get it. You are thrown out of the Gnostic well, church, you don't, Nick. That's you don't, it. You're, you're gone. You don't get you are, it because you, you don't different. have the secret knowledge. You have to keep attending to you know, figure out the secret knowledge. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> it's very hard to defend. I'm just going to quickly jump into this other guy. So Please. I can just get this out. Get this out. Um, Basileides is the next guy. He's in uh, Egypt. Valentinus is Rome. He was in Rome. This guy is in Egypt, also around the same time, early 2nd century. We know mostly about him from not his own writings, but from people criticizing him, like Irenaeus. So he... Uh, and Nick, apparently. And Nick. Also criticized. Yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> and so he's pretty close to Valentinus, to similar ideas. He adds a couple of his own. He, he uh, holds to some kind of metempsychosis, which is basically reincarnation of the soul. So you'll eventually get it right. Like, boy, for all your screw ups, like maybe you just need to spend some time as a cow or a squirrel or something. And then eventually you'll, you'll uh, through this knowledge, you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll make it. I'm on try 105. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And one more thing about him is he's, he's um, well, at least from the criticisms of him, he's much more, uh, he really spells out much more clearly that Christ just appeared in human form. And this is where... Oh, so Christ was not, not in actually human. No, he just ah. made himself look that way um, when he appeared to help us with, to give this secret knowledge to help people be saved. And out of this comes this it's docetism, it's called Gnostic docete, which is basically this idea that there's matter, there's spirit, and Christ just appeared a certain way. So he didn't really die on the cross. It just, you know, kind of, kind of looks See, like See, so that. of course the interesting thing with these is we, I mean, obviously we're sitting here making fun uh, of this and it sounds like you know some sort of you know comic book thing it yeah. sounds like the kind of thing that somebody would invent in like one of those uh like young adult fantasy novels that you you know that, you know four five or six of them appear every year and 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 a couple of them get made into bad movies but what you obviously have here is that the the as a piece of thought this appears to be very carefully constructed to actually destroy Christianity, in the sense that you come along, you say, for example, okay, so Christ was not human. He appeared to be human. Christ was not human, and so he didn't really die on the cross. Well, okay, well, first, if Christ doesn't die on the cross, there is no redemption from Christ's death. And if Christ isn't human when he dies on the cross, then there's no redemption of man. It's a very important thing. I'm going into this in a hard line that'll be coming out in a week or two, um, where I actually do say it's very important that not just that Christ dies, but that Christ's death is the death 
death of a man in order that it can pay the, 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 the price for the sins of men. And suddenly at this point, yeah, you're, this isn't just some, you know, harmless idiocy. Right. This is striking right at the heart uh, of, of Christianity, but in a way that people probably wouldn't notice if they weren't very well catechized and very well versed. Yeah, they're going to hear some of the words of Christianity, the furniture, and then you can confuse them with that. So, and back to it's an attack on Christianity. I mean, the whole idea of there being a father, and then Sophia wants to know that, and then from Sophia comes the demiurge. That's a mockery of the Trinity, basically. So instead of the Father eternally begetting the Son, and from them proceeds the Holy Spirit, you have this, well, this one wanted to know something that you didn't want to tell him, and so because of that, there's this third thing which created the physical. You're just making fun of the Trinity at that yeah. point, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it created a huge problem in the early church. I mean, we talked about this was going on in the second century. Uh, but as you mentioned, Dr. Mahoney, this goes even back to uh, the writing or the time of the writing of the Book of Revelation, because you have the uh, uh, Nicolaitan I believe they were Correct. called. They were, uh, many believe they were a Gnostic sect that uh, St. John was running against. Uh, but fast forward, you know, a couple of generations into the second century, and this created a huge problem for the church because you not only had, uh, you know, Gnostics coming in, you know, from the East and mixing Greek mythology and ancient Persian mythology and all these things to create Gnosticism. Um, as we said, it's been, it's been going on since the dawn of humanity, but it really ramps up here. Uh, but you have the advent of of Christian Gnosticism and even, uh, you know, so-called Christian Gnostic scriptures that were contenders for the New Testament. And uh, Irenaeus was one of the ones who, uh, you know, championed things like apostolic succession, championed things like the, the inspired divine revelation of scripture, and uh, would, you know, obviously he was a, a member of the church, right? He, he was a cleric himself. So he, he worked with the hierarchy to uh, establish what the New Testament is and the parameters that need to be set on the criteria that they considered each piece of work. So when they looked at these Gnostic Gospels, they could say, well, does it line up with the rest of Scripture? That's a big red flag if it doesn't. Uh, is it being accepted by, you know, the church in Corinth, all these various other churches throughout the ancient Mediterranean world? If it wasn't, that's a red flag too. And maybe those things are inspired by the Holy Scripture. So Irenaeus was, uh, you know, through this battle against the, the Gnostic sects, he was instrumental in bringing about the canon as we know it today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go into that actually in the, the uh, series, uh, Where Did the Bible Come From?, which you can watch online uh, if you have premium subscription it's there and also you can buy it uh, on dvd and it comes with uh, a book and a timeline and all this kind of stuff but the, we do go into the whole issue of how do you determine if a thing is canon yeah gnosticism uh, was was really it was putting a lot of stuff out there that they were really trying to get in to, to christianity at that point yeah, that's why, thankfully, he wrote this book, the Against Heresies, the translation, the English translation, but Against Heresies. And it's really, like, kind of revolutionary to have all these things, all the topics he talked about in one place. I mean, talking about apostolic secession already, this is, you know, he's in... Uh, he dies around 200 AD. So it went from St. John to Polycarp to Irenaeus in terms of, so uh, St. John taught Polycarp, Polycarp, Polycarp taught Irenaeus. So great line right there, mm -hmm. just a start. But he's talking about these things like dualism, one of the things that uh, like you were talking about with the, you know, the soul is good, but the body is so bad. Mm -hmm. And that was a contentious thing for a long time in philosophy and all was whether the body was any good at all. And Irenaeus was one of the champions of no God created the matter and God created the body and all these things so they're good and yeah very very big for that time to hear those things but I mean the, uh, the book goes into yeah the unity of the old and new testament he's because a lot of the Gnostics and all believe that you know the God of the old testament he was kind of soft he wasn't that great of a God and then all of a sudden the new testament God of Jesus Christ like he's the real deal yeah. And so that's, a, that's another one. You have the um, yeah, direction of dualism. And then, yeah, the whole, the whole sacred knowledge thing as well that he's going into. He even talks about how people who with no, he'd rather people have no knowledge and great love of God than to have all this knowledge and go off and create your own, your own God or idol because you have all this knowledge. Yeah, and it's, it's so it's, it's very interesting that, you know, you, we're, obviously we're talking about this happening sort of in, you know, the, the second century and this kind of thing. Uh, and, and, you know, you, <laughs> there is, there is the old joke. So there is, there was a, there was a, a sect of Gnostics or pseudo Gnostics uh, within France uh, during the sort of early Middle Ages. 
um, and uh, they were called the Albigensians because that was named after where they were located. Um, and uh, the, the joke is, who is the more effective uh, order of Catholic religious? Is it the Jesuits or is it the Dominicans? Well, the Jesuits were founded to defeat Protestantism. The Dominicans were founded to defeat Albigensianism. And have you ever met an Albigensian? And the fact is, well, no, you haven't met an Albigensian on the basis that they the, put them all Did the, the Jesuits get subsumed by the Protestants? Did the Jesuits, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's entirely, but I think probably actually the Jesuits got subsumed by the Albigensians. <laughs> so you don't see an Albigensian, a Cathar these days. You don't see some pseudo Zoroastrian Gnostic or whatever. But what you do see is you see people who have these uh, very Gnostic ideas in the church today. So, for example, um, when the, uh, Martin Luther came along with his ideas of Protestantism and he was like, well, we're just going to make the scriptures available to everyone. The scriptures previously had been available to everyone. It was just that they were available in the language that people could read. They were available in Latin and, you know, they, they were also available in, in various vernacular languages as well in particular ways. But what happened was it wasn't so much here's a book that you can read. It came to the point of here's permission to read it and to make decisions and comments about it. At which point, to your point, Nick, you end up with this idea of, well, um, I've got a bit of knowledge about the Gospels, but I don't have any love of God, and I'm just making some stuff up. <laughs> Henry VIII, not exactly a friend of the Catholic Church, Henry VIII lamented um, following uh, Martin Luther. He lamented that um, people were reading the scriptures and just making up their own ideas and blethering on about them and prattling it around like a street corner whittling, I think, was actually his description there, which is obviously terrible. Your notion there, you mentioned, of that uh, the physical realm is bad uh, and uh, the bodies are bad, but the spirit is good. How many times have we seen that kind of idea within Christians, not just Protestants, but Catholics too, this kind of idea that, oh, well, it's, it's just, it's all about spiritualism. It's just about what's on the inside the count. What I do with my body doesn't matter. And that's, that's one of yeah. the big tenets of like Luther is that our, you know, our body is, we are bad mm. and then God just like covers us up and just makes us whole way like we escape into heaven through the back door we get into heaven it's not like we can do anything to actually merit to have this grace that you know to our we're actually good we were created good mm -hmm. we do sin but we can get past that and we're expected to get past that it's not that we're just expected to you know just go around and live our life just say we believe in Jesus and he covers up our badness for us and sneaks us into heaven yeah well I mean when you think about it you know saying I believe in Jesus. You know, I believe that this thing was done. I believe Jesus died on the cross and he died for me. Okay, well, what does believe mean? It means I know this and I'm certain of it. I have a certain knowledge, okay? I have a degree uh, of certainty about this. Okay, that's just Gnosticism. Sola Fides is essentially just a slight variation. It's Gnosticism with the serial numbers filed off. That's all it is. And again, we see this even today within, you know, Catholics. So we're like, well, I don't need to go to Mass. I don't need to go to confession because you just, and it's like, this is a Protestant idea. It's a Gnostic idea. In fact, because really there's three theological virtues. Faith is only one of them. There's also hope and ultimately there's charity. So if you're only working on one of those virtues to the exclusion of there too you have a problem and like with our lord for example when he comes out of the water and with uh, uh, when john the baptist baptizes him god says this is my son listen to him now listen is the same word aqua in greek is to obey so it's not just believe assent to some you know to some ideas and have this knowledge it's do what he says obey uh -huh. him uh -huh. so it's more so faith uh, hope and love they work together it's more than just I sent to these uh, this, this system here. I can say the creed, sure, but I have to live it. Like that's the whole point. I have to be living this. Yeah. So. Remember, Christ said, if, "If you love me, you will keep my commandments." Exactly. That's that's an action. That, you know, that's a, that's a you, verb. It yes. requires bodily action. Right. This goes against the Gnostics. I mean, even when Gnosticism was first developing in the early church, you had even even splinter groups amongst themselves and. And this is exemplified in how these different groups thought about the body. You would have groups that would say, uh, hey, you know, uh, well, you know, we think the material world is evil, so therefore we're going to eschew all pleasure. So you would have uh, extreme fasting amongst these early Gnostics. You would have, uh, you know, very, various bodily mortifications that they would, they would undergo. But then you had uh, other groups of Gnostics saying, yeah, the other extreme. It was, it was total indulgence. Well, the body doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I do with my body. I'm gonna, and they engaged in things like, you know, 
public orgies and things like that. And this is what people do today. You know, they, they think that, they forget the fact that we have an incarnational religion, right? right? Uh, Christ didn't just tell us a secret knowledge. He actually came down here. He became man and he showed us how to live and mm. that requires action. And yeah. with most Christians, even Catholics today, the secret knowledge has become whatever the Holy Spirit told me. Well, the Holy Spirit told me this verse means this. Yeah. Well, the yeah. Holy Spirit told yeah, me yeah, to yeah, do yeah. this. And so the Holy Spirit is now the secret knowledge that apart from what anyone else says, if the Holy Spirit told me to do that through whatever inspiration, that is the knowledge of, you know, my path to salvation or what he allows for me. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I think I heard this once. And I could be wrong. If somebody knows differently, please correct me here. And if somebody, you know, not, nobody on the panel knows, somebody please correct me in the thing. But... I thought that I read or heard somebody say once, somebody should have known, that there is no approved locution or uh, revelation or anything like that where the Holy Spirit directly spoke to somebody in words. So we have revelations from the Father and they're in words. And obviously we've got many revelations from God the Son, where Jesus Christ has appeared to many people and said, you know, you will adore my sacred heart, etc., etc., etc. But it actually said that the Holy Spirit didn't speak in that way. I could be wrong. I can't think of one. It's just Generally speaking, it's like Mary appears. Absolutely, she's like you know this this constant uh, constant series of apparitions of one form or another. All these approved apparitions, obviously not speaking about you know anything that's unapproved. Uh, obviously, God the Son, Jesus Christ, He's appearing and, and talking to people. You know, I know that there are there are fewer revelations from from God the Father in that sense. Uh, you know, there are, and obviously various other saints will appear to people and so forth. But I, yeah, like a Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit appeared and. Sp spoke to you and so as your point it's like well you know the holy spirit told me this or did you just kind of feel that it was that was, is that where you were going with this when the holy spirit told me you know came to me in a dream yeah, yeah it's one of those for maybe pentecost but i don't know maybe that would i don't know would that count yeah I mean, yeah holy spirit, but other than that you're right other than, heard, yeah it's like, like a proved yeah. church thing on, yeah i mean on and obviously i'm kind of speaking yeah. the post apostolic era no no I'm right about, no, you know private no, I, revelation post yeah nothing's been approved yeah that's interesting yeah i had him on senior when i was growing up and he used to say like um you know, because people would say, well, oh, the Spirit told me this, and oh, the Spirit told me to get blue curtains from my kitchen, and, you know, they would just apply it to everything. <laughs> and he would, he would say, well, they have a very pious imagination. That's what Ooh. he would say. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's that, a cold one. I thought, that, I thought it was good. I mean, good. the only thing that we can, and I, I have heard of some unapproved ones, and they sound pretty wacky. I think they're unapproved for a reason. Right. Uh, people claiming to be guided directly by the Holy Spirit. But uh, to get to the Pentecost point, it's, it, yeah, we have to realize that it's only the church that is directly guided by the Holy Spirit that we can know in an infallible way. Yes, the Holy Spirit might be guiding you to do this thing. You might miss interpret it you might not who knows that's a matter of you know private revelation again uh, but we know for certain that the holy spirit is guiding the church and will continue to guide the church till the end of time well, definitely and also if you're confirmed especially yeah no doubt about but, it but that guidance but it's not, is not it's yeah. not him telling see, it's, you specific it's, things it's, it's yeah. a very different thing i think it's another interesting thing i think you mentioned this uh kyle about the influence of um these various other religious traditions and really what we might think of mythological traditions today because obviously we all remember uh you know grade school uh, and so forth when we'd learn about you know norse mythology and greek mythology and that sort of thing um well a lot of this stuff actually comes from uh, a kind of a persian mythology which doesn't really get a lot of coverage uh in uh, uh, american schools but it's fascinating there's a there's a religion called zoroastrianism and it's still uh active today uh but zoroastrianism teaches um a kind of equality of good and evil so there is a a a, a good figure and there is an evil figure and these figures are equal they are they are equal figures and they are constantly in opposition to each other mm -hmm. and that notion of not just the sense of good and evil but the sense of good and evil as um actual things and not evil as just an absence of good uh, or a, a departure from good or a departure from your nature but as, as actual things you know with, with a quality that all their own and of being of an equal kind of uh, power if, if you want to put such a mechanistic thing because of course from the Christian perspective it's like well the source of all goodness is God who is 
goodness. Uh, and and insofar as you are good, you are good when you do the will of God, when you uh, v- when your teleology is oriented towards God, to use the, the philosophical term. Um, and th- at that point, the issue of evil is, is an absence of good, is a disobedience of that. And we have this vision of, you know, Satan uh, as obviously, you know, the, the, this exemplar of evil. Uh, but it's, it's very common, I think, among Christians, Protestants, Catholics, uh, to sort of look at it as like, well, God and Satan are in some kind of equal opposition. Yeah. It's like, I assure yeah. you it is not. <laughs> one not is the creator, going. one is the that's creation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what's going on there. I mean, Satan, the devil himself, Aquinas would say, even in as much as he exists, he's good. His existence is good. And it's God who's holding him in existence. So at least that part's good. He's not purely evil in the sense of, because purely evil is nothing. Mm. That, that's the whole point of Aquinas on that. So yeah, it's not like, and 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 still the gap between the devil and God is infinite. Yeah. It's an infinite gap. And there's nothing, and we know from the book of Job and from the New Testament and the lives of saints, there's nothing the devil's going to do that God doesn't permit. It's just that simple. He's an ultimate power. And if he permits him to do that, and Jesus, we know like he, let, he went out from the midst of them because it wasn't his time. It was, you know, it, it's always going to be when God chooses and what he lets him. And we know Job, you know, arguing with God over how to punish Job and also, yeah, so the devil is powerful, but he's not all powerful. Yeah, so that not like gets God. rid of Zoroastrianism and... It's not like a boxing match. We have two right. equally st- uh, strong opponents right. duking it out. And sometimes God takes some hits. And sometimes the <laughs> devil takes right. some hits. And you know, but in the end, God will win. It's like no, the, God's not. God's way above that. He's you know tinkering all the things, and it's he's like just an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not that way. <laughs> I mean, the battle is really uh, for human souls at the end Absolutely. of the day. Absolutely. That, that's really all. The battle is fought kind of in our arena and for for our souls. So and, we, and it's fought by us. I think is, it. is kind of the most important thing. Nobody is going to die and end up in, in, in heaven or hell right. and be like, oh yeah, this is what happened. You know, uh, I won the card game, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I won the, yeah, you, you were put down as, as, as a bet in the card game or the game of chess, or whatever <laughs> it is. Uh, remember Chris Berg's song, The Spanish Train? Remember that one? Oh my gosh, no. you like, just have terrible Sorry. musical taste, despite <laughs> what we did yesterday. Krista yeah. Berg has this song, which is really very Gnostic in many ways. A lot of the stuff Krista Berg does is actually quite, you know, pseudo-Christian in many ways. But um, he's got this song called The Spanish Train, and it's about uh, the devil and God playing cards oh. for the souls of the people who oh. died on this train. And <laughs> um, it's like, okay, it's a great song, but... It's complete garbage yeah. in, in theological terms. It's like some chess game where they're playing and, yep. oh, I'm going to sacrifice this pawn so I can take this take figure this instead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to say one little side thing about Zoroastrianism that so people know, like, it's still around today. Oh, yeah, like, that's yeah. still very much a thing. And I know in uh, Gujarat in India, because my mom's got a friend from there, and she was Zoroastrian for a long time, but she was a very much of goodwill. And when she started learning of the Catholic faith, she finally converted. And now she's an absolutely devout Catholic. So, yeah. But that's a real thing. She was telling me all about Zoroastrianism and how yeah. she grew up. So that's... I mean, to me, I think you just have to follow your horoscope, and then you'll be... That's all the knowledge you need right there. Oh, the Zodiac? The Zodiac. Zodiac. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting, because if you... If you... You know, I I don't want people to get the wrong idea here in terms of knowledge, because, you know, knowledge is good. Mm -hmm. We mentioned it's not enough, but it is good. So, yes, study the faith. Obviously, we want people to do that. Uh, I would say there's a a such thing as as a true gnosis, a true knowledge, and that is divine revelation. That's what we all need to learn and follow, right? And I think Irenaeus even recognized this. We mentioned his great work against heresies. I mean, that's a multi-volume work. It took him a long time to finish that. But again, it was a huge problem that he was dealing with, so he had to devote that much time and energy to it. Uh, But what people forget is there's a subtitle to that book. It's not only against heresies. The subtitle is On the Detection and Over throw of the so-called gnosis mm. uh, bearing in mind that there is a true notion gnosis again that's that's divine revelation yeah that's that's very beginning uh, Baltimore catechism why were you created to know love and serve God which yeah. requires knowledge but it requires the proper knowledge from the proper institution in which God created in order for you to come to know him yeah and I think I think as well what you have is it's this issue of a secret knowledge so obviously many of these Gnostic cults would have a kind of uh, you know sort of pseudo priesthood and various 
like levels you would have to go through, kind of you know like the like like the masons or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's okay. And, and as you progress through each level, greater mysteries are revealed to you. And of course, this again I think is very much inspired by some of these religions from uh, the the Middle and the Near East, such as for example Mithraism, uh, Mithraism, which was uh, the, the worship of the great god uh, Mithra or Mithras. Uh, and uh, this was uh, this this god who was a kind of a sun god and and very powerful appeared in the form of a bull and there were various uh, stages that you had to go through in this mystery cult and you would be initiated into the new mysteries through rituals and you would learn knowledge now obviously that's very different from Christianity so for Christianity it's like okay here's the knowledge and it is available to you it is written down uh, the you know it's, as I mentioned you know obviously that the, there's a lot of claims by the Protestants that you know all oh, the Catholics held the Bible secretly and it's like I assure you that we did not had we wanted to hold the Bible secretly we would just not have published it right. um, and it was it was uh, published in, in as many languages as it needed to be published in from from really the get-go the notion that Luther made it available in the vernacular languages is just flat lie um, it was read to people it was there in addition of course sola scriptura the bible alone is a load of malarkey people were given the knowledge that they that they had available uh, that, that they needed to have about Christ it's not some secret knowledge um, you know and and as well it's not a question of you've been initiated to the next level of the mystery it's not like you come along and say okay now you're confirmed and so now we're gonna tell you what's really going on it's like okay now you're confirmed and okay we're gonna tell you what we told you last week because you may have forgotten or you're not putting into practice in your life you know uh, so I, I think that's good and just on a kind of related note semi related obviously we have our pre premium content on the channel and some people have kind of accused us of like oh you're charging for the gospel and whatever we're not charging for the gospel we're charging for content that we make that's the whole thing we got to keep the lights on uh, we do have however a number of very generous supporters who have donated premium subscriptions if you can't afford a premium subscription and you would like one just write to us here email us and on a first come first serve basis we will hand those out you know we're not sitting on like some secret knowledge or anything here you know I mean there's nothing that we're doing is like no Gnostic or secret in that sense it's just that dude I gotta keep the lights on right. that's not what your show how really to get to heaven was about no, no it's not Shh, guys, don't tell <laughs> us. Don't tell just, us. just to pick up on what you're saying about knowledge of course that's true because e even in morning prayer we say the canticle of Zechariah where he says knowledge of salvation so knowledge of course is important there's many icons of Christ the teacher mm -hmm. who imparts knowledge to us it's just it's just yeah so what the problem with the Gnostics is like any heresy you're taking something which is good and the truth and you're twisting it into something it's not so and it, but it's not secretive. Our Lord told the apostles, what you hear now, you'll preach from the rooftops. Like, this is for the, mm. we're going to throw this out to the whole world. There's nothing secret about it. So. Yeah, and it gets to the question of, well, why do people want to be a part of these groups? And, and the secret element really answers that. It's elite. Yeah, exactly. You get to know something that uh, other people don't know. And this is what the early Gnostics were claiming. That, uh, you know, the apostles, they, they didn't get that information from Jesus. We got the information from Jesus and we're passing it down. It's sort of like a, a twisted version of apostolic succession. And Irenaeus came along and said, no, you know, the doctrine of apostolic succession is this gets passed down to this person. Person, you know, guided by the Holy Spirit and all the rest. But people want to be a part of these these secret groups, and, and it's even you know still today, you know, secret societies and things like that. That's why conspiracy theories are so are so uh, appealing. It's like mm. the mainstream thinks this, but you know, I I know the real truth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, you think about how these secret societies uh, uh, work. You know, for example, specifically with the with the Gnostics, um, they thought, as as we mentioned, that there was some evil god that you know accidentally created matter, and some human beings, these divine spark things, got trapped into this matter, and that's like the worst sin of all is for you to get incarnated. So you got to get out of this body somehow. I don't know. I, I like the, I like the one better where women were created as a punishment to man. You yeah, know, and they're just handle. Box, all, all, all that, all that ghetto. That's. A, it could, I don't know if I'm going to subscribe to one. It could be that. It could be that. So, so when you're in this mindset and you're like, I got to get out of my body. How do Sitting I? Sitting there in Dave Gordon's chair. I see. <laughs> <laughs> even at one. Someone's, someone's got to fill in for that. Man. Whoa. Yeah, but for the. <laughs> 
for the people who want to, you know, who are Gnostic and, and want to achieve a higher plane of whatever, I mean, there is that human desire to to be divinized, right? That's a, that's a good God holy, you know, God given holy thing, but it's it's perverted once again. Um, what what do they do? They create these secret societies. They feel like they're special, like they're part of something. They even have like secret handshakes and passwords, and uh, you know, I got this information and you don't type of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think it's 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 worth looking as well at how much Gnosticism has influenced kind of our uh, popular culture. Okay, so the 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 the, the guys in the, uh, in the in the in the graphics department have put together um, a, a short clip from a movie. I'm sure we will all recognize. So if we can roll tape on this one, this one is from the Matrix Revolutions, which is the second sequel to The Matrix, which was actually a really very good uh, movie in in every respect. Came out over Easter that year. Um, and uh, what you have here, though, is while there's a lot of Christian imagery and a lot of Christian symbolism within the Matrix, and there's many different ways of reading it, you've got an awful lot of Gnosticism within there, this notion of the secret knowledge. So what you have, of course, here is you have these characters, Neo there, played by uh, Keanu Reeves, the hero. He is freed from this illusionary world that has been created, and he's freed into reality by the possession of this secret knowledge knowledge that is imparted to him by, uh, you know, Morpheus, uh, who is, you know, the, 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 this character who has this kind of initiation. He's gone through these various stages. He's been initiated. He passes that information over. And what they're doing, of course, is they're fighting for a freedom, a release from falsehood. That's what the whole focus there uh, of, of, of the movie is about. And yeah, you can look at these various uh, things and parallels and characters within the uh, within the Matrix. There's Agent Smith there, of course, played wonderfully by Hugo Weaving. Um, and uh, he is trying to keep the humans in this uh, in in this uh, false world, oh. and, it, and it would be very bad for them and bad for the agents, bad for the machines for them to be released. And so, now, certainly, that's not the only way to read the Matrix. I've actually read some uh, wonderful analyses that suggest you can read it from a very Christian perspective. But certainly, within that complexity, there um, you've got that sort of thing. And so many of these movies are all about, okay, well, here's here's the revelation to you. You all of these, as I mentioned before, these these young adult things where you have these young adult stories which obviously appeal to uh, children on the cusp of adulthood and they're always about well you are special you are the chosen one and you have some secret knowledge that will enable you I've, I've, I've opened you into a wider world you have some secret knowledge that will enable you to save the world totally the opposite from the one that they usually try to uh, ape and uh, mimic which is Lord of the Rings where of course the hero of the Lord of the Rings is not a man with some secret knowledge. He's not a man with some special thing. He's a man with a task and with people to support. And of course, Frodo doesn't have some secret knowledge about the world. He's constantly like being surprised by the things that he sees. But it's it's not you're the savior of the world because what you know. It's you're the savior of the world because you've got to get rid of this corrupting thing. It's a very Christian message as opposed to Gnostic. Yeah, and I think that's uh, why Pope Francis last year in God's providence mm -hmm. made Irenaeus a doctor of the church, oh, cool. holding up his work as someone who needs to be greatly revered because of all these things that we see that are still very prevalent today and even in some ways making resurgences in terms of all the, you know, the movies you're talking about or groups that are popping up or secret societies, all those things. And so I think it was very providential that Irenaeus last year was made a doctor of the church and he has this great corpus of work where he defend, you know, defends apostolic session, defends the Eucharist. One, one of the one of the best early one of the best early father Eucharist accounts and yeah dualism all these different things that he combats and so I, yeah I think it was a very good move by Pope Francis last year to make him a doctor of the church. But even even within the the church, uh, even within the good people who, who read Irenaeus, uh, some some of our friends in the Catholic world, I think there's this you know what I what I want to call a, a trad gnosis going on in mm. the church. Uh, you know, um, amongst the the you're red, sitting in Dave Gordon's chair. I'm, I'm okay, sorry, good, I have to do it. I'm not going to say anything you know bad about the Latin Mass here. But there there's the traditional Catholics out there, and I understand why they fall into this. But but they fall into it. They say we know the truth. 
truth. They see the problems going on in the church. They see you know stuff coming out of Rome that that you know they raise an eyebrow at, and rightly so. And they say, no, there's something else going on here. There, there's there's this underground church that's you know these bishops are clandestinely ordaining people. We're going to have masses in the basement and all this, and we're going to study you know the old teachings of the faith, the real teachings of the faith, and we know better mm. because we are you know uh, the the preconciliar Catholics as as opposed to the you know conciliar church as they yeah call it's, it. it's 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 this idea that we have retained some sense of secret knowledge uh, which which is, which is just kind of bizarre because it is is question of okay an, an authentic reading of any document of the church is within the light of the entire corpus of the church you don't just get to say I mean I've said it you know that the the uh, the, the, the error of the radtrads and the error of the you know I don't know, the, 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 the ultra-modernist church. The error of them both is that they believe that the church began at the Second Vatican Council. And the Radtrads are believing, well, the church, the conciliar church, began at the Second Vatican Council. It's this new thing, uh, and, and it, it had no connection to anything that came before. And, of course, the, the, the crazy modernists are believing, well, that that's when the church began, and there's no connection to anything before. And it's like, no, you're both wrong. There's a single continuum there, and you, you need to find it uh, and, and look at it there. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, that is a very... Uh, you know, real and true thing that there is this, this this tendency sometimes among the trads, you know, to come out and say, well, this is this is how you should pray, and this is the way to do it, and this is the way to uh, do that, and and and, and the, the liturgy that is given to us by the church herself is not good enough, and that's like, okay, that is yeah, that's dangerous and it's gnostic. But to be fair, it's not the, it's not the majority of people no. going to the FSSP and the Institute. Now, when you're talking about Sadie Vacantis and this, I agree with you 100%. They've just they've lost the narrative. Yeah, you can't you can't defend the church by walking away from her. No. Like it doesn't make any sense, of course. And there are some of those, and there's some I won't mention names, but there are some other sites out there that get really crazy into this stuff. And you're right, yeah. and those are like the, they go like crazy trad. Yeah. There's some that would tell you Pius the Tenth isn't really a saint. I mean, they go they go like nuts, right? <laughs> so, but the average person that goes oh yeah I, yeah they're they're usually fine and yeah, yeah they, but they think, don't think that but i think yeah. the average person though you see the, the the risk is that the average person who's a person of goodwill yeah. and who is a person with love of god in their heart and perhaps isn't a person because catechesis has been terrible within the modernist church within the 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 the, the, the rad trad church with everything in between catechesis has been terrible the person doesn't have a lot of knowledge and so that they can be very easily persuaded of some of these That's true. concerns and some of these problems and some of these things just like somebody without a solid grounding in history or something like that can be persuaded of a conspiracy theory because you don't know that the things that are that are that are lying uh, underlying it you can be persuaded of one of these things and you can be led down the garden path onto one of these things for example i saw on one of these sites again i won't mention it but it was a site that was saying we have the secret way to pray to the holy spirit to get your Prayers answered. Like, the, there's a secret what? way. <laughs> now, I understand, obviously, that, there's, that everybody has got their favorite novena, okay? So everyone's got their favorite novena. Christy Niles has her, uh, I think it's the Unfailing St. Joseph novena, which Christy Niles has a tremendous track record of using the Unfailing St. Joseph novena to, uh, to, 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 to get things And it's never uh, failed. And it has never failed, apparently, because it's called the Unfailing novena. Um, you know, there. But I, you know, Christine certainly would not be putting this out as some kind of thing of, like, you can get anything you want by yeah. praying. This is, this is the secret way to right. do it. Christine will just give you this thing, you know, for the right. asking. Yeah. You know, she's there. And, uh, you know, obviously as well, when you talk about, you know, praying, it's like, yes, God answers all prayers, uh, but he doesn't necessarily answer them in the way that you want it. He answers them, you know, according to his will, which is always better for you. But yeah, when you come along and say, this is the secret way of praying to the Holy Spirit, I'm like, okay, that is just straight up Gnosticism, yeah. son. That is not even like subtle at this point. Just a, just a silly point to add to that. When you read some of these <coughs> Gnostic te texts outside of Valentinus, there are other ones. There was one we had when we were reading in class one day at the Angelicum, and it was a Dominican priest, and he was just started reading one of these Gnostic tests, texts. And after the guy explained something, he literally just starts writing vowels like it's some kind of chant. <laughs> this is an ancient Greek, too. And he goes, e -o -a, like some secret prayer and all. Like it gets like crazy yeah. weird. Like, oh, this is how you talk to the Holy Spirit, you yep. know? So, yeah, that stuff, that's it's very ancient and very um, still with us today. <laughs> oh, it, it is. <laughs> and, and speaking of that, I would say there is this sort of 
modern Western Gnosticism going around. Um, there's there's many good thinkers out there who have a theory that, you know, this has leached into you know what became communism, what became Marxism, and what has now become wokeness, uh, because you know none of this actually makes sense in reality. You know, people thinking they can change their biological sex, for instance. Th these things are you know totally outside the realm of logic. But you know, you go into their own little. It, it is a religion. It, it's like, like an esoteric religion all, almost because they you know they have their doctrine you know they have their mantras they have their heresy and they have their way to excommunicate them you know people from it so that's really that's where it comes from a certain sense of Gnosticism and one of their their founding fathers is uh, the psychologist um, Carl Jung mm -hmm. so Carl Jung um, as much praise as he gets from people like Jordan Peterson uh, you know this is one of the dangers of Peterson's thinking uh, for all the good that he's done uh, he upholds holds a lot of Carl Jung. Bishop Barron also speaks highly of Jung as well, go figure. Uh, but uh, Carl Jung, uh, you know, many neo-Gnostics, you know, we said there was not a lot of these people, and there's no more Albigensians, but there are some neo-Gnostics running around out there. And they consider uh, the psychologist Carl Jung as their, their patron saint, the mm. saint of Gnosticism, basically. And I mean, if you if you read Carl Jung, you, you'll see crazy, you know, things that, that seem to be almost mystical, you know, um, where he's talking about, you know, Jung, Jung had a very active imagination, a very, uh, a very powerful imagination. Mm -hmm. So he was able to, you know, he he was that daydreaming kid, right? He would just sit out there and imagine things. And he got to a certain point where he was actually, uh, he would create, you know, characters in his mind, we can say, and he would ask them questions and they would answer back and he would get knowledge from that. So that's that kind of sent him on his own Gnostic Yikes. bent, I think, and his disciples do the same thing. So, so that's, so, I mean, there are, there are two possibilities there. One, the, the, the boy's got, you know, some kind of multiple personality disorder, you know, and he's, you know, kind of, you know, mentally deficient in, in that way, or he's actually communing with demons. I mean, these, these are your two options. I think that is a thing that I, I would want to really talk about here because, okay, so we have a whole world, uh, uh, really, you know, several worlds, uh, at least two, you know, the physical world and the spiritual world, that are populated with things. They are populated with beings. They are populated with creatures. Obviously, all things have their origin in God. God has created creatures. There is no thing that he did not, uh, at the very least, passively will to exist. Um, and in the writings of St. Paul and elsewhere, other writings uh, that are approved by the church, you can see that, okay, it's not simply there are humans and then there is... There are angels, and there are fallen angels, and there are good angels. There's, there's this suggestion of, there's this whole realms of other things out there that, in his wisdom, God has created, and which are nothing to do with us. And this is, and you can, you can read it in various ways, and when you come along and you say, okay, from a Gnostic perspective, we're going to commune with these aeons. <laughs> we're going to commune with these people. We're going to try to get in touch with these spirits and stuff. You're shouting into the void and something is going to answer. We have been given a very clear way of how we should communicate with the spiritual realm. We've been very clearly told it's called prayer and prayer should be directed towards uh, God and it should be directed towards the angels of God, and it should be directed towards those humans that the church has said are worthy of having prayer directed at them. And obviously there's different kinds of prayer, there's, there's worship and, and, and then there's you know, the prayer obviously that we give to the saints. But what you're doing with Gnosticism is, it, it's, it's like your Ouija board or your tarot cards or all these kind of things. You are shouting out into the void saying, hey, spirits, come chat with me. And some spirit is going to come and go, all right, mate, let's go. And he's probably not going to be a nice one on the basis that the nice spirits are waiting for you to pray, not shout out there in some, you know, bizarre Gnostic idea. Yeah. And so what answers are you getting? Like really bad ones. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and uh, other examples of that in more recent times, like theosophy, right? This is a Gnostic thing where they do exactly what you're talking about. You have like Helena Blavatsky. She was uh, she was guided by her ascendant masters who would like reveal information to her, you know? Another one, Alistair Crowley, right? He was another big one. Uh, and he had, uh, I forget, I think he called it an ascendant master as well, but he had a specific one that really helped him, you know, yeah. write his uh, book of, uh, you know, the whole of the law is do what thou wilt, that whole, you know, the book of the law, I think it's called. Yeah, book of the yeah, law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had that 
one, and, and he drew a picture of that too, of the, this this thing that was, you know, how this ascendant master that was giving him this secret knowledge that no one else had for his book, and uh, kind of looks like a. Have you ever? Seen, I don't recommend you go look at this, but if you do, it's a, it kind of looks like an alien actually. It's just like yeah. you know, kind of like the weird almond head. But yeah. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there's this stuff is so this is like not just back in the second century. Yeah. Like this is. You know, and these and these are things that good Catholics can get suckered into. Like, no good Catholic is going to go out and, and, you know, participate in the Black Mass. No good Catholic is going to go out and start, you know, uh, worshipping Satan or anything like that. No good Catholic is going to go out and, like, be using a, a Ouija board or tarot cards or something like that. They're not going to do that. But there's a lot of stuff out there that's like, oh, how to get in touch, you know, with, with the angels. And here's this special prayer of how to get in touch with the angels. So I'm like, that is not the St. Michael prayer. I have yeah, no idea yeah. where you got that <laughs> right. from. But you look at it, it's like, this is kind of weird. Yeah. You're shouting into the void and something is going to answer. Wasn't there a board game recently that you reported on? Yeah, yeah, I think something Christine on Amazon. Something on the Holy Spirit on the, uh, game or something, huh? It was yeah, it the I did Spirit a report, game? and then she went further and affordable the episode. It was called the Holy Spirit board game. What that, what it actually was, was a bunch of obnoxious children that making fun of Christianity because you know they have science. So uh, and so they made this this ridiculous board game. It was like a Ouija board where you could talk directly to the Holy Spirit, but. Um, now, even though they meant it as a joke and they're, they're, just, they're just obviously just silly kids, it's still very dangerous yeah. to play with things like that. Well, it, so. it, it, interestingly, you know, it's, it's a thing that you can bring up. The, the, the Ouija board um, is, is a copyrighted thing, and the copyright is owned by, I think, Hasbro or, Hasbro? or one of those Tell toy them. companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's owned by one of those toy companies. Um, and, you know, so every Ouija board that you see in, in the store to buy is actually, you know, licensed from that company. So... Obviously, this isn't a particularly old thing. The fact that the copyright right. is still there, you know, copyright expires after a while and so forth. It, this is not a particularly old thing. It's been, it's been there. But obviously, again, what it is, is it's not that there's some, you know, because if we were to say, well, oh, yeah, the Ouija board doing that, that gives you some special access to demon. No, that would just be another form of Gnosticism. Right. What it is, basically, it's this idea that if you are going to try to engage with the supernatural in a way that is not approved by God, God, something other than God is going to answer, and all of them are inimical to humanity. Every single last one of them, That's you know? Right. And, and yeah, it's, yeah, no, so don't be mucking with yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, at, at the heart of all of it is you're seeking knowledge that you don't have a right to is what you're really doing and you're trying to access something that you don't have a right to and in most of the cases I mean you're just going to get lies back you're going to get half truths and everything else and, but but basically you're God's not hiding anything from you you know for your salvation like he, he's told us what we need to know to be saved and he's not hiding anything from you and he promises that when you're with him you're, he, you know he told his apostles I have much more to reveal you to you you can't bear it right now but he's going to reveal everything for all of eternity to you so he's not hiding anything but for now he's told you what you need to know to be saved and if you go trying to find all these other secret things and what's going to happen tomorrow and what about this and you're you're seeking things you just don't have a right to right now so really underneath all of gnosticism of course is pride so yeah i want to highlight that uh, human beings you know we get the prideful notion that we think we need to know everything that we we want to know right. and we don't this is why uh the church and you know saint thomas aquinas would consider things like uh, a sinful vicious version of curiosity right and we see that with uh the advent of the internet today. People spending way too much time on their phone, people spending way too much time online trying to get the information, whether whether it's news or sports or politics or even stuff going on in the church. They're trying to consume it all at one point because they think that if they just understand it or know what's going on, somehow that's going to help them spiritually maybe mm -hmm. when they should have been, you know, just going to mass, when they should have been, you know, actually praying or, you know, spending time with their loved ones or something. And, and no, they're, they're concerned about this chaotic thing in the church. Yes, it's good to know. It's good to consult websites like Church Milton. Obviously, set a, uh, a very limited amount of time to know what's going on mm -hmm. in the church and in the world. You you have a, a duty to do that. Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a phrase that I use a lot, um, and I use it a lot with, with the staff here, not so much the people in, in this building, but the people in South, kind of the administrative side. And often, it, we'll, we'll get a question asked about, um, you know, how, uh, you know, how many people viewed that particular piece of content, or how many people have signed up for this event, or da, da 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 and there's often a thing, okay, I want this information as in, now, to this point as absolute accuracy, and my phrase is, very often, will possession of this knowledge change your behavior? 
If it won't change your behavior, there is no point in having the knowledge. If possession of the knowledge will change what you're going to do, then obviously it's valuable. But if possession of the knowledge will not change your behavior, if you're going to carry on, uh, you know, like promoting tickets for the Strength and Honor Conference, which is happening <laughs> at the first weekend of August, you should come. It's great. Um, but knowing exactly how many tickets we've sold for that to the minute is not going to change how marketing is going to be promoting that out on, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter and so forth like that. But having a general idea, yep, yeah, we can see what worked, what didn't. But to the minute, no. And again, it's that question. Will this knowledge change your behavior? If the knowledge will not change your behavior, it's probably not worth knowing. All right. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of The Download. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly did. Now, please join us as we finish in prayer, begging our ladies' intercession for our nation and our church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Salve Regina. Mater misericordia. Vita dolcedo. Et spes nostra. Salve, a te clamamus exules fili eve, a te suspiramus gementes afflentes in hac lacrimarum vale, ea ergo advocata nostra, ilos tuos misericordes oculos ad nos converte, et Jesum benedictum fruitum ventris tui, nobis vos hoc exilium ostende, o clemens o pia, o dulcis virgo Maria, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for the download. We premiere a new episode like this every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Don't forget, if you want a premium subscription, you can't afford it, just write in. Uh, obviously, email us in so that we've got your email and can write back and stuff. Uh, and we will hook you up if we have any left from our generous donors. From all of us here at Church Milton, may God bless you.